to indeed fight the good fight. Our faith is a gift of God for that purpose. It is a, something to fight for and with. The text before us this morning speaks about the dangers and the threats that exist in this world against our faith. But it also speaks about the help that our God gives us, that He is always with us, that He will defend us and strengthen us and keep us in the one true faith. Fight the good fight. Our text for this morning is taken from the book of Acts, where we read in the 20th chapter, the text in its entirety is 25 to 31. We will just read a couple of verses at this point to help us find the thought to think on as we progress in the sermon. Keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock. In the name of our Savior Jesus, my dear fellow redeemed in Christ. If you need a counselor, who would you go to? There are a lot of counselors that we could go to. I'm sure that it would depend on the circumstances that we are troubled by to determine which one we would go to. I'm sure that we have a, a number of people at our disposal that if we have a difficulty or a problem or a circumstance which we can't really handle or don't quite know how to approach it, we have those that we can go to. In answer to the question, where would you go? I'm sure that the answer is, it depends. It depends on what the problem is. It depends on the circumstance. If it's a financial problem, I might go to a friend who has his act together, or I might go to a professional that he would recommend, or I might even go to my pastor and seek spiritual guidance in this matter. If it's a parenting problem or a marital problem or a moral issue, the answer is quite easy. We go to our pastor or our fellow Christian to get guidance from there. But no matter where we go, we want to note three things and be aware of three things. Those three things are, first of all, does the advice given fit the problem? Or is it something that might make it worse? Not one size does not fit all. Not everything fits everyone. Secondly, when you get the advice, and if it fits, do it. One of the biggest problems that we people have is something called procrastination. And procrastination simply means we put it off. That we can do that tomorrow. Tomorrow comes, we can do it tomorrow. You know the old saying, tomorrow never comes. And the third thing is that we are patient patient with the progress. We waited and waited to go to the, get the advice, and now we want the results yesterday. Be patient. And this is especially true because God is involved. Everything a Christian is involved in brings God into the picture as well. You know, earlier we talked about going to our pastor, or the Word, or prayer, in order to solve this problem. Be patient. 
Sometimes when I listen on TV or radio to the experts, so-called, I want to go to their studio and ask them one simple question. What does the Bible say? What does God say? Our focus this morning is not necessarily on what God says, but that he always has something to say about whatever it is that troubles us, and especially about our spiritual lives. Let us now focus on this word of God and consider this thought. The counsel, God counsels his people. He warns them that they live in much danger, especially spiritual danger. And secondly, he advises them, follow me and my word. We read in our text. I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock. Even from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples. After them, after them, so be on your guard. Remember that for three years, I never stopped warning each of you, night and day, with tears. The Apostle Paul is taking leave of a congregation at Ephesus, a congregation that he had been with for three years, which in those days was quite a while, especially with the Apostle Paul. He would come in, leave one of his helpers with them, and then go on to do the same thing in another place, and so on. But here he stayed among them because they had some difficulties that they were dealing with. But now he was about to take his leave. He had some big business in Jerusalem. Those of you that were in Bible class this morning heard about the discussions that Paul often had with the, with the uh, Jews. They didn't like Paul, those that didn't convert to Christianity. And so he was going to Jerusalem to see what their problem was and then deal with it. But he was pretty sure that the end result would be that he would have to appeal to Rome. And that's really what happened. Once Paul went to Rome, he never came back. He spent quite a number of years, we don't know how many exactly, but he was there for quite a long time. And he was, was not in prison all the time. Toward the end of his life he was, but for the most part he was under house arrest. He had his own house that he lived in. He had a soldier by his side all the time. But he was free to have those soldiers take their, him wherever they wanted to go. So that's where Paul will be. And the Ephesians will be on their own. And he said, as soon as I leave, vicious, savage wolves will enter this congregation. He wasn't talking about the animal wolf. He was talking about worse wolves, false teachers. Those false teachers were waiting for Paul to leave. They perhaps were salivating at the idea that he was going to be gone and they could do whatever they wanted to with these people. Our text tells us that they were, they came from within and from without. That's the sad part, that last part. They came from within, not just from the outside. And what did they do? They distorted the truth. They distorted God's word. They twisted everything. Some people followed them, and others just plain dropped out. It was indeed the same thing as if savage wolves had come into the congregation. Their purpose was to divide and conquer. 
Their purpose was to scare people into following them. And some did. Their purpose was to mislead and confuse. <coughs> the Apostle Paul had warned them through his protege, Timothy. He wrote these words to Timothy some time before this. For the time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own device, desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn to the, their ears away from the truth and turn aside <coughs> to myths. When we read that, it's very devastating to even think about it. We think of our own congregation and something like that happening. <coughs> that would be frightening, and more than that, it would be horrible to think about. But yet it's not impossible. It could happen. The Apostle Paul had written these wor words some years before this, but they could apply after he left. And what's really frightening, they can still apply, and sometimes do. We know what false teachers are doing to various churches and denominations throughout the world. There is an old adage that says, when you're at a certain spot, it's easy to get to point A and point B in different ways. Perhaps many of you did that this morning as you came to church. The variety of ways that you could have come. Or when you have to go to work tomorrow, you try to figure out where the least amount of traffic will be. And it's true, you could get to various points, A to B, in different ways. My father-in-law lived most of his life in Wisconsin. And there were roads everywhere. He never took the two or the same road twice, as long as he lived there, I don't think. And when he came out to live in Oregon, the first thing he noticed was that from Portland there were only two ways to get to the beach, or maybe three. That drove him crazy. There are many who would like to make the same thing true about getting to heaven. Have you ever heard that? I'm sure you have. That there's many ways to get to heaven. But our God says, no way. There is one way, and it's not the easiest way in the world. It's straight and it's narrow. And the word straight is a little different than going straight. It's straight has to do with stricture. But there are difficulties along the way. And that's pretty obvious, and that's what the people at Ephesus are dealing with. God has some advice in this regard about the one way to heaven. He says through 1 John, Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. And it said to the Gospel writer, John, to the Jews who had believed in him, Jesus said, if you hold to my teachings, you are really my disciples. The truth will make you free. And others as well. But the point is clear. There's only one way to get to heaven. By grace you are saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God. What could be clearer and simpler than that? But at the same time, we want to know that there are many spiritual stories floating around. The word narrative has come alive today to picture something that's not right on target or at least is a little different. 
And many religious people do that with scripture. The Bible isn't good enough anymore. We have to come up with a different narrative. But again, God jumps in and says, no way. He says in Hebrews, do not be carried away by all kinds of strange teachings. It is good for our heart to be strengthened by grace, not by ceremonial foods, which are of no value to those who eat them. And to the Romans he said, I urge you brothers to watch out for those who cause divisions and offenses and put obstacles in your way that are contrary to the teaching you have learned. Keep away from them. Watch out for danger. There is danger. We've all seen those signs along the highway as there's road construction. Danger ahead. Watch out. There are a lot of those signs put there by God on the way to heaven. God counsels us. There are dangers. But there are also ways of dealing with those dangers, as Paul now tells us. Now I know that none of you, among whom I have gone about preaching, the kingdom will ever see me again. Therefore I declare to you today that I am innocent of the blood of all men. For I have not hesitated to proclaim to you the whole will of God. Keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. There's an antidote for all of these dangers. There's a way of avoiding it. There's a way of circling it, getting around it. First of all, our text tells us that following the example of Paul is one way. The Apostle Paul makes the point here that he always stayed away from those false teachings. And he was attacked many times. <clears throat> You had the Judaizers in Galatia, the Nicolaitans were in some of the Asian churches, and there were Gnostics, those that didn't believe in faith but followed their heads, and other such things that tried to deter him. But he always stayed away. And he always says, I never shed any blood or forced anybody to do anything. I simply put the Holy Spirit to work. I preached law, and I preached gospel. The law says, you're a sinner, lost and condemned. But you're saved, you're forgiven, by the grace of an almighty and gracious God. That's what Paul preached. And that's the way we want to also preach. And then here's some advice from the Apostle or from God himself. He says, be overseers and shepherds. Now we often speak of the pastor as the overseer and the shepherd of a congregation, but he needs lots of helpers. And that's you. I've often used this illustration pastor is the under-shepherd of Christ, and the rest of us are the dogs that help bring in the sheep. Shepherds will not bring without dogs, do they? They don't get very far. And so that's what God is saying. Work together. Don't expect the pastor to do everything, but rather help him as best we can to counteract these dangers that the Apostle Paul was talking about. And then he goes to the heart of the matter. He says, cling to him who paid for our sins with his blood. 
That's quite a payment. I don't think we pay too many bills with our blood. Maybe it seems that way once in a while, but it isn't at all. Not this way. Jesus died on the cross to pay for the sins of the world from the beginning of time to the end of time. When he cried out, it is finished on the cross, every sin was his. It did not exist anymore. We want to remember who we are. We are God's people. A couple of young women, good friends, belong to different Lutheran churches. But at work they had a common problem. They were dealing with people who were not Christians and were pretty, ang ang pretty uh, outspoken about it. And so they thought they needed some advice. So they went to the pastor of one of them. And he said simply, don't make an issue of it. Be yourself. Be yourself. Do the things that God wants you to do. And if somebody doesn't like it, it's not your problem. It's his or hers. Be a child of God. And that's the advice that we want to close with. God's advice to his people on earth. First of all, we turn to 1 Corinthians. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I always thank God for you because of his grace given you in Christ Jesus. And again, 1 John. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard so that you also may have fellowship with us. The Apostle John. And our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We have a wonderful family. Paul's part of it. John's part of it. But more importantly, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit are part of the family. keep on the same path that you've always been on. God has made you something. He has made you his people. Stick to it. Two more passages. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. They acted like Christians. They acted like God's family. And God took care of them. And things were really bad in those days at times. Doesn't mean some of them weren't martyred. martyred. They were. But at the same time, their faith was not taken from them. And to Matthew, Jesus said, Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. So we end where we began. No false doctrine is going to come up to you and say, Hi, I'm a false prophet. It's not going to say that. What he will say, I've learned a few things about the Bible. I'd like to share them with you. And if you say, I know the Bible. I know it pretty well. And he will say, but just a little bit different, a different slant on it. What will you say? No, thank you. I go on your way. Our God is our counselor. Our God tells us there are dangers lurking out there. He advises us, stick to him, and we can't go wrong. Fight the good fight.